Thank you so much. And uh, we will take this opportunity of welcoming our most distinguished guests. May I request Anumna Chakraborty, Chairperson of the West Bengal Commission for the Protection of Child Rights, to felicitate our Chief Guests, Sri Moloi Ghotu, Honorable Minister in Charge of Law and Judiciary. Can I request the ladies to bring the memento and the uturyo? Thank you so much. And may I call upon Shomitra Roy, well-known uh, musician, surely, but here in the capacity of being a member uh, of, uh, of the West Bengal, uh, uh, West Bengal Commission for the Protection of Child Rights. Um, Shomitra Roy, incidentally, is a member of the only Asian band which has performed at the UN. And he would be welcoming the Honorable Justice Girish Chandra Gupta, Chairperson, SHRC. May I request Shudeshna Roy uh, to kindly come up and felicitate uh, Sri Ajay Ranadi, IPS, IGI, CIT. Members of the WCPCR felicitating our distinguished guests on the dais. Onita Basu, other member of uh, WBCPCR, to kindly come up and felicitate Mr. Blair Burns. Is uh, Onita Basu doing the honors? Another member of WBCPCR, uh, Shakila Sultana Shams. Can we request you, ma'am, to come in and felicitate ADG, Mr. Ramesh. Thank you so much. And now, may I request uh, the chairperson of the West Bengal Commission for the Protection of Child Rights, Anuna Chakraborty, to welcome our most distinguished guests. I extend a very warm welcome to everyone here on behalf of West Bengal Commission for Protection of Child Rights. We are overwhelmed by the response that we have received from the international community, as well as the other states, from all the commissions, Child Rights Commissions, Women's Commissions, and Human Rights Commissions, the law enforcement agencies, and our own state. The judiciary, the police, and the commissions are a crucial part, play a crucial part in combating trafficking of all sorts. However, we need to be better prepared to counter technology. So this, this uh, conference is basically to wage a war against cybercrime, any kind of cybercrime that is done especially against children. So this convention reflects the commitment that we all have in protecting our children globally as well as in India and the state of West Bengal. 
West Bengal has approximately 3.2 crore children. There is no data to show about the extent of this nature of crime being committed in Bengal. However, we felt it is important to be prepared before it hits us. Several studies have been done in the capacity of individual <coughs> states or governments in many countries. But we felt that we must come together nationally and internationally to share the experiences, challenges, and good practices. I look forward to the two-day consultation and I'm optimistic that we will come up with an effective way or effective ways to counter it. There is a saying, what West Bengal thinks today, India thinks tomorrow. West Bengal is proud to host this event. We have been preparing it for over one year, and this would not have been possible without the support of International Justice Mission. The idea was ours, the concept was ours, but almost the entire footwork was done by IGN. So thank you, IGN. And, and I hope and I'm confident that we will do many such programs together in the future for the sake of our children. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we uh, have a signature video. We have prepared a signature video on the conference. So can we start the audio visual, please? Criminals and traffickers across the world are now using the power of technology, the power of social media, and the cover of emerging technologies to exploit children the poor and the unsuspecting vulnerable. The content of child sexual abuse found on sites are increasing every year. Agents and middlemen offering jobs and romance in the promise of a better life are popular social media sites to trap the victims. The modus operandi to the Digital space has made the modern trafficker smarter and safer. ICSEC is a global gathering of experts to discuss, deliberate, share, learn and reflect on ways to prevent crime and protect children. Let us unite to fight for our children. We are their hope. With this video, of course, working on our subconscious, can we request Sri Voloi Kotok, Honorable Minister in Charge, Law and Judiciary, for his address. Justice Girish Chandra Gupta, former Chief Justice of Calcutta High Court, and Chairperson, West Bengal Human Rights Commission, Mrs. Anonna Chakraborty, Chairperson of West Bengal Commission for Protection of Child Rights, Mr. Billair Burns, Chief Program Officer of International Justice Mission, Mr. Ajay Ranade, IG, one CID, Mr. Pradeep Panjab, Register of Human Rights Commission sitting on the dais and other dignitaries present today who are sitting on the dais. I convey my sincere thanks to West Bengal Commission for Protection of Child Rights as well as IJM for holding this conference which is one of its kind probably first in our country. The theme of this conference is sexual exploitation of children 
in a digital era. So in the digital era, there are two sides. There are some positive side of the digital era are the internet, a free website based platform to the children to enable interactions online by using images, PowerPoints, presentations and documents with full audio and video sharing, etc. It also is a platform of the people and children to share their opinions with others on ideas related to art, culture, business, economics and other medias. Internet helps the children to learn by typing to do something rather than just to know something. The internet provides updated information on a variety of classrooms related topics unavailable from other sources. The internet acts as a digital library. Also, a student can have the access to a library that is 100 times as extensive in comparison to a school library. The internet acts as an effective medium of preparing the children for the future competitive examinations. With so many advantages to its credit, the world of internet is a boon to the children, not only for their educational purpose, but also for their relaxation and entertainment through the world of music, available free of cost in different sites. There is the other side of the cyber era. That is the internet is a tool that can be used in good and evil. This internet dangers a section of book highlights the primary dangers to the kids online with specific focus on the sexual exploitations and other dangerous <coughs> things. So this is a good effort by the IGM and also by the West Bengal Commission of Protection of Child Rights to highlight this issue and especially before the guardians how to protect their child in the digital era. Our government always helping the West Bengal Commission for Protection of Child Rights for the protections of child. I again convey before I conclude my sincere thanks both to IJM and West Bengal Commission for Protection of Child Rights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. And may we now request the Honorable Justice Girish Chandra Gupta, Chairperson, SHRC, for his address. Minister Sri Malay Ghatak, Honorable Chairperson of the Commission for Protection of Child Rights, Srimati Anunna Chakravarti, Mr. Blair Barnes, Chief Program Officer, Mr. B. N. Ramesh, Dr. B. N. Ramesh, 
ए डी जी ऑफ पुलिस मिस्टर अजय राणा दे इंस्पेक्टर जनरल सी आई डी श्री प्रदीप पांजा रजिस्ट्रार ऑफ वेस्ट बेंगाल ह्यूमन राइट्स कमीशन आदर डिग्नेटरीज ऑफ एंड ऑन द डैस लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन I am obliged to Sri Mati Chakravarti as well as IGM because they gave me an opportunity to come to this gathering, which I am sure is likely to add to my little knowledge about the exploitation of the children in the era of internet. the influence of technology especially the internet is immense in that perspective the question necessarily arises is whether it is a boon to human life or is it a threat to life and the collective well being no one can deny that internet has offered unlimited opportunity for communication commerce learning and expression digital technology has also changed the world as more and more children go online around the world it is increasingly changing the childhood previously during our childhood days there were only way of recre uh, recreation for the children was to play in the fields that was the recreation but today invariably you will find children busy with the mobile phone the youth between the age of 15 to 24 is the most connected age group the study shows worldwide 71% children are online compared with 48% of the total population children and adolescents under 18 account for an estimated one in three internet users around the world a growing body of evidence indicates that children are accessing the internet at increasingly younger ages in some countries children under 15 are as likely to use the internet as adults over 25 now as i told you that the children are glued to the internet or to the mobile phone having various apps which forbodes the darker side of the internet all of us have in our memory the minis arising out of blue well many children committed suicide the matter was taken to the supreme court in the case of sneha kalita versus union of india the supreme court took affidavits from all the stakeholders and in one affidavit it was affirmed that the children were sharing blue well change challenge game among secretive groups on social media networks and the creators seek out their players victims who are in depression and send them an invitation to join the game the supreme court opined that suffice it to say that 50 steps that the blue well game conceives of are dangerous to life and whatever endangers life has to be condemned and can never be allowed section 69a of the information technology act empowers the ministry of electronics and information technology to issue directions for blocking 
of public access to any information through any computer resource in the interest of sovereignty and integrity of India. Defense of India, security of the state, friendly relations with the foreign states or public order or for preventing incitement to the commission of any cognizable offence. The ministry issued directives to Google India, Microsoft India, Facebook India, Yahoo India, directing them to ensure that all links of the Blue Well challenging game and of any similar game are immediately removed from their platforms. The Supreme Court issued the following direction and I quote, Keeping the aforesaid in view, we direct the Chief Secretaries of the State and the Union Territories through their departments concerned to spread awareness in the schools run by the state who in their turn shall make aware the children about the danger of such games propagated by bringing people into a trap. We may hasten to clarify that making people aware about a danger has to be done with clarity, concern and taking it within the sweep of the duty of the state. There may not be such a problem in that state, but the children must grow up with an awareness that such a thing exists. It is in this backdrop that the endeavor of IBM and the Commission for Child Protection is relevant, more and more relevant, it is becoming day by day. We have to spread awareness. The awareness on the part of adults is equally necessary as it is for the children. Because the children are under the guidance of the adults. So the adults have also to be sensitized about the necessity of protecting the children from the menace. Among many offensive acts of cyberspace, online abuse is a common phenomenon all over the world, which has directly or indirectly affected online users of different age groups, leading to different forms of harassment, such as gender bullying, trolling, stalking, etc. Cyber harassment may be defined. What actually is meant by cyber harassment? It's a repeated, unsolicited, hostile behavior by a person through a cyberspace with the intent to terrify, intimidate, humiliate, threaten, harass or stalk someone else. Having someone in the real world, hurting someone in the real world may be physical or verbal. But hurting someone online would surely be by online abusive language message or hateful comments. If such offenses are not recognized as contempt of humanity and illegitimate act, there are fair chances of cyber offenses and related issues to be worsened. It can be said without any room for doubt that the worst form of cyber abuse is where users send post humiliating and hurting words online, which may result in depression, humiliation and sometimes drive to suicide as their own comrades release, harassing the targets to gratify their own perverse, barbarous gratification. Now, in the, as I already have referred to the Informati Information Technology Act, an amendment was made in the year 2008. By amending the Act, Section 66A was introduced. That section dealt with sending of offensive messages applied to grossly offensive or menacing or false information and also covered cyber bullying, cyber harassment, cyber stalking and piecing. The section was however struck down 
on the ground that the same violated the freedom and speech of expression freedom of speech and expression now that might have been a drawback of that section but that section also protected the general people from a large number of menaces i will give you a concrete example the type of harassment which is fatal in june 2006 16 in the salem district of tamil nadu a 21 year old woman saw a picture of her face digitally superimposed on the body of another woman posted on a social networking site she informed her parents and also identified the man responsible for it it was alleged that she had rejected his proposal of marriage and to get back at her he mocked her picture using a mobile phone app uploaded it on the site and tagged her on the post the woman's father lodged a complaint with the cyber crime cell a few days later she found another distorted image tagged to her social networking account with her name and her father's phone number on the same day the woman committed suicide in her suicidal note she expressed her complete ignorance about the distorted images and her failure to convince anybody she could not convince anyone that she had no hand in it and the entire thing was fabricated so this is the type of danger to which the entire society is ex exposed this is high time when some positive steps are taken section 66a was a wholesome provision in the law which has been struck down but a substitute which does not infringe upon the freedom of speech and expression is 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 a is a burning necessity regard being a human right activist i you will forget me forgive me if i refer to the declarations of human rights because that is my bible so if you have regard to clause 2 of article 25 of the universal declaration of human rights which says motherhood and childhood are entitled to special care and assistance all children whether born in or out of wedlock shall enjoy the same social protection so with regard to providing protection to motherhood and childhood provisions were made people thought about the same in the year 1948 when these declarations were made we are still deliberating on the same subject and this will go on so once again congratulations to the commission for child protection and the igm for organizing this timely program and i am hopeful that they will continue the endeavor until this menace is eradicated thank you for giving me a patient thank you thank you so much sir may we now call upon shri ajay ranadi ips igi cit for his address good morning justice girish chandra gupta ananya ma'am chairman wbc pcr shri malay ghatak mics ma'am shri bian ramesh project coordinator igm and the dignitaries present we are opening a new chapter in the history of bengal today we are as ma'am said we are this is a war cry against exploitation of women in bengal when we talk of exploitation of women many things crop up in our mind 
it all starts from the parenting the immediate neighborhood the family and other influences on the child in the digital era where the digital penetration is increasing by many percentage points every day children are getting exposed and are becoming vulnerable to abuse on online media while internet is a very good tool in fact it is inevitable it has to be used it has to it has its potential for good of human kind in terms of education in terms of developmental needs and other things it also makes children vulnerable and this vulnerability of children is the most important factor that needs to be taken into account when we deal with children in traditional societies when digital uh, era was one there they were still exploited by unscrupulous elements but the reach and the impact was limited with digitization a morphed image or anything like that has a devastating impact on the emotional well-being of a child and when we are here to address this issue we have to think in terms of prevention in terms of creating robust mechanisms to address the issue and to decide and suggest to the government's concern what we can do to better the situation as far as prevention is concerned i feel awareness is the best thing and awareness means when we are allowing our children to access the internet we should also make them aware that what are the pitfalls how they are vulnerable how whatever they are posting innocuously can be misused and abused this needs proper digital safety education which needs to be incorporated in our school curriculum through awareness camps in schools and other things in bengal there are programs various gov uh, government of west bengal has taken various steps there is sukanya there is uh, uh, there are other programs we have also from police we have started swayam siddha these are programs which our school outreach programs and they target school children when we target school children we try to explain to them what are the modus, what is the modus operandi of of traffickers or the abusers what steps or what precautions need to be taken so that is one part of uh, prevention as a strategy on a larger perspective you also think of creating robust legal framework we need massive capacity building and when it is a digital world where there are developments every day the technology is fast changing we need continuous upgradation continuous capacity building sensitization of the police and all the other stakeholders and as a philosophy we need to continuously think of ways to reduce the opportunity for crime this is a new philosophy where we think of ways there will always be people who will exploit the existing things but we need to create firewalls create systems where the opportunity to use these mechanisms for wrong illegal purposes can be reduced one last thing when we want to protect our children there was a quote by kofi annan the health of a nation or health of a society can be judged by the way you have your children their safety their education their basic needs that decides the that decides the development or the stage of your society and when we want to protect our children when we want to create mechanisms for protecting them it, it can't be done by the government alone or by any one agency it's a team work we need civil society we need the media to create awareness we need our schools we need everyone and everyone here to chip in with whatever small steps they can take so that we can make a holistic approach we can have a broad mass movement to protect our children there are uh, as sir has said there are issues of privacy when we want to erect new laws but then laws come into effect or have a deterrence value when the incident has happened we should focus on a situation where incidents don't happen or children are strong enough to take care of themselves thank you
Thank you so much. I will call upon a very special speaker now, Tanvi Surana from the Heritage School. And Tanvi is going to talk on behalf of the 3.3 crore children of West Bengal. We call upon Tanvi. scenario in our country is that every 30 seconds a child is abused, every 8 minutes a child goes missing and every day a child is trafficked. With the advent of the technological age, it is possible that this number will rise further. Good morning, I am Tanvi Surana, a student of class 12 from the Heritage School. In November 2017, my teacher asked me if I wanted to attend a seminar on the dissemination of information on commercial sexual exploitation of children. Having a deep interest in human rights, I jumped at the opportunity. Since then, I have interned with International Justice Mission for three weeks to understand this issue in greater depth. During that time, I looked at anti-human trafficking modules and even visited shelter homes, among other things. Before I offer my opinions on the issue, I would like to thank the West Bengal Co Commission for Protection of Child Rights and International Justice Mission for this opportunity where I get to be the voice of almost 472 million children and adolescents in India while discussing sexual exploitation of children in a digital era. I opened a an account on Facebook when I was only 8 years old. It wasn't very tough considering that I just had to click a button to certify that I was older than 13. My friend, another eight-year-old, helped me set it up. When I went home and told my mom, she didn't ask too many questions. Back then, social media was a very obscure presence in our lives. Cut to almost a dec decade later, and my mother got a rude shock when she finally understood what exactly cyber crimes were. She had unknowingly let me join such a dangerous platform as an eight-year-old. We must understand that with the increasing rate of smartphone adoption among young people and the widespread availability of the internet, getting access to social media has only become easier. I, do not want you to, I don't want to ask you to help wean our generation on social media. Social media has become an essential part of our identity. In fact, social media and the internet have been extremely beneficial to us. I mean, I am in touch with a friend I haven't seen for five years just because we both have access to cell phones and have social media accounts. To a great extent, our generation, Gen Z, relies entirely on technology to perform simple tasks in our day-to-day -day life, and that has helped make us more aware, efficient, competitive, and creative. At the same time, however, this digital world, the extent of which is almost hard to fathom, can often be uncomfortable and even dangerous. From a very tender age, children have access to malicious information. In fact, due to a lack of understanding, porn can present a child with extremely unhealthy notions on sex. To give you a very small example of this, everybody in my class has either sent or received a sext, a text message which is explicitly sexual. Sex can be quite unwelcome and between peers can disrupt a conducive learning environment. When it can happen between friends, it can just as easily happen between a child and an adult. That one nude picture, one sexual text, one selfie will be enough to haunt a person for the rest of their lives. Now we can connect with strangers around the world instantly. The memes all over the internet embodying the explicit sexual messages that strangers can send provides just a tiny taste of what goes on literally behind the scenes and have not even touched upon the dangers present in the crevices of the internet, such as the dark web. One can get access to assassins, weapons, drugs, or young children if one has enough money. And the use of cryptocurrency ensures anonymity. This phenomenon of anonymity has embol emboldened people to act in ways that they never would in real life. Thus, it can easily become very nasty very, very quickly. Now when I'm referring to my experience or my peers' experience of social media, I must acknowledge that we come from a place of privilege. A place where our parents have started understanding the use and dangers of social media and provide a sort of safety net for us. A place where our schools have informed us about the risks of social media. However, that is not the case with everyone. 
People enter the digital realm unaware of how careful they need to be. This ignorance can become a death wish for thousands of children who are entrapped and exploited by predators. To give you two recent and relevant scenarios, we have the Blue Whale Challenge and the Momo Challenge, where naive children are preyed on and they pay with their lives. What is scarier is that sufficient laws do not exist to protect against commercial sexual exploitation in the digital era. It's like we've made a house in the jungle, keeping all the doors and windows open, and then we expect to be safe from the elements. When we step into the digital realm, we are completely exposed and susceptible to all sorts of exploitation, including commercial sex sexual exploitation. Even the recent controversy on di with digital laws mostly focuses on privacy rights, sidelining the issue of safety, which is utterly relevant to children today. There are certain commendable conventions that exist to protect child, right, uh, child rights, such as the UNCRC. In fact, in India, the Juvenile Justice Act does deal with children in conflict with the law and children in need of care and protection. However, before my engagement with International Justice Mission, I did not even know they existed. On a wider context, with the taboo that surrounds sex in the Asian communities, it is difficult for adults to inform children of this issue. Limited attention is given to educating children on technology and its dangers. The education system needs to be modernized and the society as a whole must come together and form cohesive bonds to ensure that a positive dialogue can begin. <coughs> All I want to say is that I think it's time to involve children in discourses that concern them. We, from almost the beginning of our lives, have been bombarded with so much information that we are much more apprised of issues than previous generations. So it's only fair that our voices are heard. Because our opinions matter. And it matters now more than ever before. Today, I stand here as one of the fortunate among 472 million children to appeal to you to begin this dialogue to build a safety net for children around the globe, to foster care, protection, and safety as a vital part of a child's life at home, at school, and in the community by taking our views into consideration. I wish the organizing team from the West Bengal Commission for Protection of Child Rights, International Justice Mission, and all our honorable guests, dignitaries, moderators, panelists, speakers, and fellow delegates to take these two days of deliberation to bring about a framework for the protection of children in the digital era. Thank you. Thank you so much. Tanvi Surana raising her voice not only for the children of West Bengal, but as she said again and again, the 472 million children all over the world. It was indeed, uh, we are indeed very grateful to her for giving us the child's perspective on today's issue. Thank you so much once again. We will take this opportunity of Felicitating some of our most distinguished guests, members of the Diplomatic Corps who are present here today. Uh, may I request Anunna Chakraborty, Chairperson, uh, West Bengal Council for Protection of Child Rights, to do the honours. Patty Hoffman, Consul General, US Consulate, is here. We would like to <coughs> felicitate her. Uh, Anunna Chakraborty doing the honours. We are also very happy to have with us today Mr. Bruce Bucknell, uh, the British Deputy High Commissioner, and uh, Mr. Namit Shah, Honorable Consul General, Netherlands. So we would like to welcome all three of you onto the dais and uh, felicitate you. <coughs> Mr. Bruce Bucknell, British Deputy High Commissioner. Being felicitated by Onuna Chakraborty. <laughs> Chairperson, West Bengal Council for Protection of Child Rights, Onuna Chakraborty. Felicitating Mr. Bruce Bucknell. And Mr. Namit Shah, the Honorary Consul General, Netherlands.
Honorary Consul General Netherlands, Mr. Hamid Shah, being felicitated by Anima Jatinikin. Thanks to both of you. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, it's time for the keynote address. Mr. Blair Burns, the Chief Program Officer of the International Justice Mission, would now provide the keynote address. Good morning. I have to share with you, I'm a little, I'm a little stressed because the Madam MC, who's doing a fantastic job, she said that we shouldn't have a cheery good morning and I wasn't sure if there was another kind. So good morning, and I, I think we can be cheery. I'm sorry, but I think we can be cheery because, because this is a fight we're going to win. And the explo sexual exploitation of children, it, does, it is something that needs to be cast aside, and it will be. Um, we are men and women of action here today, and we're going to talk about how we're going to end this. I do want to thank a few people, uh, especially uh, Ms. Ananya Chakraborty, uh, for having me here and for co-hosting this with us. The West Bengal Commission for the Protection of Child Rights is a wonderful partner and is doing great work, um, and has been so gracious to allow us to be here. And so uh, thank you so much for that. And it's also, I just want to say, it's, it's such a great pleasure for me to be in India. Um, I lived in India long ago. Uh, I raised my older children here. And uh, every time I get the opportunity to come back, I am super, super thrilled. If we could bring up my, oh, there it is. Oh, sorry. Let's go through that one. So they asked me to, to take this time to introduce to you uh, about IJM's work, and so I'm going to do that, but we're also going to get a little bit into what I really think is the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter at, um, and I love the conference slogan, to prevent crime. Like, how do we do that? We're going to talk about that today. I promise you I am not going to talk about the technology, because I can't, but my colleague is going to do that. But what I'm going to do is talk to you about, about preventing crime, and I'm going to talk to you about the mission of International Justice Mission. IJM protects the vulnerable from violence by partnering with authorities to rescue victims, to restore survivors, to bring criminals to justice, and to strengthen justice systems. Now, now who are the vulnerable? In societies across the world, the vulnerable, the people who are most vulnerable to crime are the poor. The United Nations tells us that four billion people live outside of the protection of law. Four billion people, that is a lot of people. And the people who are most outside of the law's protection are the people who are poor. And the reason for that is that the rich and, and even the middle class, they can, afford, they can afford to protect themselves, and so they do. If you want a very sort of quick way to understand what justice systems in the world are struggling to protect the citizenry from violence, you need only look at one indicator, and that indicator is the amount of money in a, that a country spends on private security. Because there are countries in this world where the number one industry in that country is private security. And what, it, what, what is happening there is those countries are so violent that the people who of means are able to go out and they are able to hire people to protect them. But the problem is there are masses of poor people and they cannot do that. And so that is why this is our mission, to protect the vulnerable from violence. And like all organizations, we have a theory of change. The first idea that I want to talk to you about on the theory of change is this, is this first point, that the, the idea that the end of poverty requires the end of violence. The world has been fighting poverty in a concerted fashion for about 70 years. Since the end of World War II, the world got together and we said, we are going to stop poverty. And we have made a lot of progress on that. But there is still a long, long way to go. And, and the problem is, the challenge for that, for that next part of that road, the challenge there is that you can't stop poverty unless you deal with the violence that affects the poor. Now, why is that? Well, everybody really knows how you stop poverty. <laughs> You take a person who is poor, a person who is an economic drag on society, and you take that person and you turn him or her into an economic engine. And how do you turn them into an economic engine? You educate. 
You give them opportunities for, for job training, and you give them opportunities to start business. But if, if the poor are plagued by violence, none of those things are going to work. If you are afraid, in fact, if you are certain that your daughter is going to be raped when she gets to school or on her way to school, you're not going to send her to school. If you are a person and you, and you can get a microfinance loan to start your own business, but you know that as you do so, somebody who is stronger and more powerful is going to come and take that livelihood from you, you're not going to bother to start the business. And so as societies continue to grapple with ending poverty, we, we have to figure out how we're going to end violence. So, that, so the end of violence, though, that requires the end of impunity. Now, impunity is a fancy word. But it, but it means a very simple thing. Impunity just means without punishment or without consequence. And the heart of the matter on fighting crime is this, is this one word, impunity. And it works like this. Every person that commits an act of violence makes a decision to do that. And so, for instance, in the case of a trafficker, a trafficker is making a decision. And he's like, okay, he's doing some math, and he's thinking, I wanna make some money. So what I should do is I should take some children and I should capture them and I should have a business where I, I give them to other people to rape them so that I can profit. The great news is, is there's a huge market of people who will pay for that. And so after I figured all of my expenses out, I realized I can make a lot of money. Impunity means that that, convert, that, that, that decision process ends right there. Because at no point does that, does, does that uh, future perpetrator make them sit, uh, consider into his calculation, hey, you know, I might go to jail. Because, because there's impunity, and so he's not, afraid that he, he's not afraid that he will go to jail. But if you sweep away impunity, if you make that go away, then what happens? Okay, so the person is still making the decision. He's like, well, I know I can make a lot of money if I sell children to be raped for profit. But you know, my friend Bob, the brothel owner, he went to jail last week for doing the same very thing. And I met those two other guys at the brothel owner convention a few weeks ago, and they said they were being prosecuted too. And so at that point, at that decision point, there's a new part of the calculus that comes in. And the new part of the calculus is, I'm risking my own livelihood, I'm risking my own freedom by doing this. And here's the thing, at that point, most humans are not going to take the choice to, 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 to commit the violence. I say this to people all the time, and they're like, well, not everyone. And yeah, you're right. There's a few people that are gonna try to get away with it, but most won't. And I'll take, and, and versus none, I'll take most every time. So the end of violence requires the end of impunity, and so what do you wanna do? You wanna bring, you wanna, you wanna get rid of impunity. What's the first step to doing that? The first step to doing that is you're gonna pass a law and you're going to say, for instance, in the case of trafficking, you're gonna say it is illegal to sell children for rape. And if you do it, the law says that you're gonna to go to jail for, I don't know, 10 years or 20 years. The good news is, the very good news is that in every country in the world right now that has a functioning government, every country in the world, trafficking is against the law. And it is against the law and the country has assigned a criminal penalty to it. And that's a big thing. For instance, in my country, up until 1865, there were huge swaths of the country where you could traffic anybody you like, and the country said, fine, that's fine. But not anymore. Now, across the world, it's against the law. But the bad news is, is those laws are not always being enforced. See, in order to sweep away the impunity, there must be a system that delivers the protection of law to the people. The law has to be enforced. But the really bad news is that if you have a law and you don't enforce it, it is just like not having the law. In fact, you could even make an argument that it's a little bit worse. Because when a person is making that decision about whether to commit that act of violence, they are never thinking about this idea that they might go to jail. They're just thinking about how much money they can make. And when that happens, 
a lot of people get hurt. Let's talk about a few examples. We've, at IJM, we've been doing this work for about 21 years, and so we have some examples of, of, of what happens when governments, when governments change that calculus, when governments change that decision. Uh, the Philippines, if you've never been to the Philippines, you should totally go. They're like the most fun people in the whole world. The Philippines, in the early 2000s, had a serious problem of the sexual exploitation of children. It was known as the paradise for pedophiles to come and rape children. In the, in the two major cities, in the, the two major metropolitan areas of the Philippines, uh, Manila and then Cebu to the staff, children were freely available for anyone who wanted to come and rape them. And, and, their, and, their, and their owners were making lots of money in that process. And so we wanted, to, we wanted to intercede in that. And we talked to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation said, we are quite interested in this. I, the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, their primary work is HIV AIDS. And so we said to them, we're like, look, a child cannot protect herself from HIV AIDS if she is being raped. <coughs> and they said, we are intrigued by this idea of yours. So why don't you show us if it'll work? And we're like, of course it'll work. And they said, no, no, why don't you show us that it will work? So we will give you some money and, 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 and do a project. And so we designed a project with, with the Gates Foundation and with the uh, local authorities in the Cebu Philippines. And we designed this project to, to rescue victims, to restore survivors, to, um, to put perpetrators in jail and to strengthen the justice system. And we work with the government to build some capacities. Uh, very similar to the AHTUs that you have here in India, we work with the government to establish a dedicated anti-trafficking unit. We work with them to build the training for that and to walk them through their cases. We work with the Department of Justice um, to, to establish a prosecutorial force that was multidisciplined because we saw that the police would, would do their work and the prosecutors would take over and they would not talk to each other. Um, and then the prosecutors were really mad that the police didn't collect the right stuff. And the police were mad that the prosecutors were mean to them. So we're like, what if you guys all work together? So they all work together and they, they created these prosecution forces. And then we work with social services to create a center for crisis care when you rescue people. But what we were really trying to do in all of that was just to create a criminal deterrent. To just change that decision by these potential brothel owners. To, to, of whether they were going to engage in this, in, in this trafficking of children. And so we told the Gates Foundation, okay, we're going to do this thing, and we're going to measure at the beginning, and we're going to measure at the end, and what we hope to see is a 20% reduction. What we hope to see is that after four years of doing this work together, that there will be 20% less children who are being raped for profit in this city. And why did we set 20% as our goal? Let me be clear. We set 20% as our goal because we thought that would be awesome. In a city like about the size of Cebu, at that time there were probably about 1,000 children who were getting raped for profit every year in the trafficking industry, which meant that if you could have a 20% reduction, you would, you would take away 200 of those. That's 200 people who were either let go from the trafficking industry or 200 people that never entered it in the first place. And we thought that would be fantastic. And so we set out to do it. And then we measured at the end of four years. And the results were shocking, mostly to us. <laughs> what we saw was a 79% reduction. In four years, the, the number of children that we were finding in the sex industry had gone down. <laughs> had gone down by 79%. The funny thing about that is no one believed us. Our civil society partners like, no way. And then our government partners like, come on, really? And then my own staff, my own staff, they were like, no way. But we're like, well, that's what the data shows. And then over time, as we started to experience it, you know, because we had people out with the police investigating every day, as we started to see what they were finding as, over time, we saw, no, that really is true. 79% of the people, um, it's gone down. And so we, 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 we were just doing this project locally in the, in the state of, um, of Cebu, and we were doing, just doing it with local authorities there, but when we got these results, we took those results nationally in, in, in the Philippines, and we told everyone we could think of about it. And then one day, it's actually, uh, actually eight years ago, I think today, I get a call from the, uh, from the Secretary of Justice of the Philippines. She says, look, I'm going to be in Washington. Uh, I'd like to meet with you. So I said, you know, I'm, I'm not busy. So... Um, I come, I come to the embassy, 
I sit down, she sits down, she looks at me and she says, tell me about those results in Cebu and tell me how we're gonna replicate that throughout the rest of my country. And I said, ma'am, you are born. I will tell you. So we told her all about it and she said, okay, what I'd like you to do is, is expand this to Manila. So we had been working in Manila for some time but we had not been doing these, these system reform things where we established the anti-trafficking unit, where we work with the prosecutorial force, where we had built the crisis care center. So we do all of that in Manila, and we also do a measurement in Manila. And in Manila, we see the same thing. In Manila, and this is over a seven year period after we had already been working for, for a while, but what we saw was a 75% reduction. And that was super encouraging and very consistent with Cebu. So we thought maybe we have something. And so then you see this other place, Pampanga. Pampanga is a state north of, of Manila in the Philippines. And Pampanga was important because it was the home to a city called Angeles, the city of angels. And the city of angels had grown up next to a former, well, at the time, a real, uh, United States Air, Air Force base. And on the fence line of that base, a red light area had grown up. And then the United States left in 1991. When they left, everybody thought that red light area would close down. It didn't. It grew. There were about 5,000 sex workers there in 1991. There were 25,000 in 2012. It had grown and it had become a, a Disneyland for sex tourists. And so the Philippines government, secretary, the Secretary of Justice had said to me, she's like, look, I need you to go to Angeles City. And I said, I need some funding. And she said, good luck with that. And so then we, we went out and we found some funding from other sources and we went to, to Pampanga. And, it, and again, we measured at the beginning and then we measured at the end. And we did the same things that we did in Manila and we did the same things that we had done in Cebu. And what we saw at the end of just four years was, was an 86% reduction. 86% of the children who were once getting raped for profit in this, in this little city out of, a, out of a sex industry of 25,000, 86% are just gone. Now, I don't want you to miss something about this graphic. I use, the, I use this graphic for a reason where it's got, you know, like the, the little people. Because what I want you to understand is this isn't just a statistic. These are real people. Or they represent, well, they're not actually real people, but they represent real people. And what it means is that 75% in Manila, 79% in Cebu, and 86% in Kampanga of people who otherwise would be getting raped right now, seven times a day, are not. They are not anymore. Some of them were let go. The rest of them never entered. And so there are literally thousands of children and adults now in the Philippines who never were raped because of this intervention. Now, I have daughters. They're really fiery. And if I... And if somebody was to take my children and, 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 and have them experience this, I would want to kill people, right? And so would all of you. But that doesn't happen anymore in this country. And why doesn't it happen? Because law enforcement has delivered the protection of the law to the people. Let's look at another country. So Cambodia. In Cambodia, in uh, 2003, these are real undercover footage that, that we took along with the police back in 2003. In 2003 in Cambodia, across the country, five, six, seven, eight, and nine-year-old girls were freely available for commercial sexual exploitation to anyone who wanted to come. And there were websites, this is sort of earliest days of the internet, but there were websites that, that perpetrators used, that pedophiles used, and on those websites, there was all the instructions where you need to go. You should go to Cambodia because your biggest expense is your flight. Because once you get there, it's super cheap. And the girls are wonderful. And so that's all there. And everybody was being pointed to go to Cambodia. And so what happened? They did. And the royal government of Cambodia was grappling with this problem. And they came out in the early 2000s and they said, honestly, as far as we can tell, in our country's gigantic sex industry, at least 15 to 30% of the people are children under the age of 15. And they said, you know, we need, we need some help. And so we got there in, the, in 2003 and we set up a partnership with civil society and we set up a partnership with the government. 
It was very similar. They're, they were set up very similar to the AHTUs here in India as well. They had already established the anti-trafficking units, and so we worked with them to bolster their response. Um, and, it, and, it was pretty, and it was pretty amazing what happened over, over the next time. We didn't uh, take a baseline measurement when we started. We, didn't, we weren't able to take a baseline measurement until 2012, after we had been working there for nine years. But when we did, when we did, and we did it again in 2015, what we saw was a 73% reduction. That's on top of whatever else had happened in the first nine years of the program, which is staggering. If you go to Cambodia now, you can go in the three cities where, uh, the three cities where the sex industries were the biggest, in Phnom Penh, and Siem Reap, where Angkor Wat is, and, uh, and Scenicville on the, on the coast. You can go to those countries, and you will see a sex industry, but you will not see children. You will not see children under 18. You certainly aren't gonna see children under 10. And what happened? What happened is that law enforcement came to bear. Law enforcement started putting people in jail. We did over 140 operations with the police. We rescued over 500 victims with the police, and they, and they earned convictions in 220 cases. And then they did a bunch of other cases where they didn't invite us. And they'd say, we're going on this operation and we're not taking you. And we said, fine, good, do it. And so they did it. Um, and what they did was they created this credible deterrent. Um, this is Captain, C Captain Ratana, who is one of the many people uh, in his country who is fighting this fight. And Captain Ratana, what he's doing in this quote, I hope all people across the world will, will become aware of the law and enforce the law together. Whenever we understand the law together, we are able to prevent and suppress trafficking. We must all work as a team. He is trying to rally the world, and he's trying to rally his nation behind him because he knows this is a fight we're going to win if we work together, if civil society, if the government works together to ensure the protections of law reach the people. At IJM, we, uh, we, we, we have taken this model. We've taken the successes we have seen all across the world. We are very inspired by the successes in the Philippines and very inspired by the successes in Cambodia, and we believe that it will work on any violent crime. Any violent crime, when that person is making that decision, if they think, but well, I might go to jail, we think most people are gonna stop doing it. And so we're all over the world. For instance, we are in uh, Kampala, Uganda. And in Kampala, Uganda, the problem is, 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 is widows and orphans are living in, in their homes, on their land, uh, but, their hus but the husband and father has died. And so the, local, the neighbors or the relatives come and they say, gosh, you know, I want that land, so you're going to need to leave. And they're bigger and they're stronger and they're more powerful. And so the mother and her children who depend on the land for their subsistence have to leave. It is a violent crime. And we have been engaging with the police in Uganda. We've been engaging with civil society in Uganda to fight this problem. And we have just gotten the results in from our, from our end of project studies in and you've gone at what we've seen is a 50% reduction in widow land grabbing uh, just in the past few years. And this is what, and, and, and following this model has also led us to this work in Guatemala. In Guatemala, we focus on child sexual assault. That is the rape of children that is not commercially based. In other words, it is opportunity based. It is when the girl goes to school and she is raped uh, by a teacher or she is raped on the way to school. And so we've been fighting those cases for many, many years. Those, that, pro, that project is also coming to an end and I, I was speaking with the evaluator just recently, and the evaluator said, look, like we had not done a baseline measurement on prevalence in this, in this project. And she said, look, I know we don't have to measure, but I can tell you from the qualitative data, we have seen a great impact on the prevalence of this crime because the justice system is working and people are going to jail for a crime that they never went to jail for before. And in India, as I said, India, of course, is my favorite country in the whole wide world. And we have seen this transformation begin to take hold here. I have been working uh, at International Justice Mission in and out of India for many, many years. And I remember walking through Sonagachi and walking through uh, the streets of Mumbai with your very well-trained police officers. And when we first started doing that in 2000, well, in Calcutta in 2006, we would walk through Sonagachi and we would see tons of children everywhere being freely sold to whoever wanted them. I walked through Sanagachi recently with some officers uh, in the last couple of years, and here's the thing. You're not going to see any children for sale there. Now, somebody might raise their hand and say, but I know there are. <laughs> yes, but, no, it's really good. 
But somebody might say, well, I know there's children. Of course, there's, there, there, there are probably some children she could, she could get away because you're always going to have the rogue person who thinks that he or she can get away with this crime. And the police are going to have to fight those people until the end of time. But just knowing that you could go to jail for this crime is going to solve most of it. And it has in Sanagachi. And it will throughout the rest, the rest of the state and the rest of the country. And that is because of the good work of the CID. That is because of the good work of the, of the Calcutta police. That is, that is because of the good work of all the government officials that are engaged in fighting this battle. At IJM, when we are trying to talk, when we are talking to other people in the world about, about stories of hope, we always come to Mumbai and Calcutta and talk about this great, this great uh, movement that is happening here about protecting the poor from violence. So thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure to be with you. Thank you for letting me come to India. Thank you for hearing me out. Um, and thank you for, for winning this fight. Thank you so much, Mr. Burns. It really gives us an excuse to be hearty now because it is so heartening, whatever you have been telling us. And now we are going to do three book releases. Handbook for Combating Commercial Sexual Exploitation, Trauma-Informed Care Booklet, and the POXO Booklet English. So uh, the books, the first, the handbook for combating commercial sexual exploitation is given to all our most distinguished guests on the dais. And uh, the protocol is that you would have to open the ribbon. If you do that standing up, that would be an added bonus for our photography team. So are we ready? Handbook for Combating Commercial Sexual Exploitation. Right. Trauma-Informed Care Booklet. Next. Once again. We'll go through the same routine, which is opening the ribbon. And Trauma Informed Care Booklet is formally released. And finally, the POXO Booklet, which is in English. The POXO Booklet in English. Although we are running a little behind schedule, what's new, we would request Dr. B. N. Ramesh, who actually looks after police regulations and manuals, and therefore it is entirely appropriate that we would ask him to speak right after the book releases. Uh, the ADG, Dr. B. N. Ramesh, may we request him to say a few words. It's a great honor to be in front of all of you. I always feel that without audium, the podium has no meaning. I respect the government of West Bengal, the Commission for Protection of Child Rights, Honorable MIC here present on the stage, Das, and Sri Girish Chandra Gupta, with whom I had an opportunity to work finest jurist, a wonderful human being, Madam Ananya Chakravarti, and my colleague, one of the outstanding police officers the country can be proud of, Sri Ajay Ranade, and uh, the representative of IJM. I'm a great admirer of IJM because it was started by a lawyer. When I came here, I was met with a lawyer, Mr. Vivek Gandhi. I think the lawyers have started the movement because the lawyers have got the incisive mind to know the issues and they are the persons with whom, with, from whose brains the solutions start. 
I am. I will only take uh, 120 seconds, not more than that. There was a case in the Supreme Court of United States way back in 19 in 1873, which uh, defined the right to life. Article 21 of our Constitution doesn't define the right the life as such, but the right to life, and according to the greatest interpretations by the greatest judges like uh, P. N. Bhagwati, included right to livelihood, which also includes right to reputation. The child is the mother of the man, they say. And the child is nothing but is going to be the citizen in few years' time to come. If we don't, as a civil society, give the production and a hope of future to the child, then perhaps the entire human race is going to be doomed, be it in Gautamala or be it in uh, India or any other place. Secondly, the child's production doesn't only mean through trafficking. Trafficking is perhaps an opportunity that the law breakers view because of the laxity of the law, law execution. I have been in the police for 30 years and I understood law means enforcement. Law means, the law doesn't mean intention. And the people out view law as a service rendered to their doorstep by the law enforcement. And if the law enforcement ensures this service to the citizens, I'm sure what was happening before the Internet of Things came to the world, there used to be a, call, a thing called Chele Dhora, Chele Dhora in Bengal. And that was there. This kind of trafficking was there in different forms, right, from human civilization. Internet of Things, blaming Internet of Things, is like blaming the person who invented the sword for all the murders in the world. Internet also gives us an opportunity, as our policemen have proved, that we are ahead of the cyber, cyber crimes, cyber criminals, in, in questions of uh, detecting the bank parties, or also in eliminating the terror threat, which we have successfully done all the world. And America is an example. They have not allowed the repetition of the 9 by 11 incident. In, in the world. And that shows that cyber expertise is a thing that police needs to cultivate, cultivate, the law enforcement needs to cultivate to give the children and the parents a hope on the law enforcement quality. Before I conclude, I must invite the attention of the schools, of the parents, to live as an example to the children. If a parent is busy or if the parents who are working for the family are busy in their own WhatsApp conversations and expecting the child not to touch the mobile phone is perhaps too far stretch of an imagination. And hence, for your own psychiatric help, it's better not to cross the limit of the one hour prescription that the psychiatrists have programmed for all of us to be with, the, with either the television or the mobile phone. Today, mobile phone is a greatest instrument that is there in this country. 120 crore mobile phones are right now there with smartphones. Those of us who are from here can always record the proceedings of this seminar and tell the people that the children need to be protected and it's the parents' responsibility to have children what the children has. Children have Sharir, Shariram Mahatbhutam, Shariram Sharam. And that Sharir must be not used as a commercial, as a seeds of commercial exploitation. And hence, my request to all the schools, all the parents, to take this as a momentum, to stand as an example, and not to make only the government and the police responsible. Of course, governments and police are there. They are there. But government is our government. Police is our police. Yadha Raja Tadha Praja and Yadha Praja Tadha Raja. Jai Hind, Vande Bhadram, Jai Chandra. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, before we break for tea, we would like to inform you, it is a, in fact our great pleasure to inform you that the IPEEK Foundation International Police Expertise Education Knowledge Exchange Foundation uh, from Netherlands 
and the International Justice Mission, IJM, has set up an experiential training console with multimedia for the law enforcement team. It is right outside uh, our registration, I mean right opposite the registration desk. So do uh, visit that particular kiosk and what you can find in that uh, wonderful uh, interactive uh, experiential a system that they have put in place is something that you can have a glimpse of as we show you a short video right now. So don't miss out on uh, the digital kiosk video and don't miss out on the kiosk itself and do check our virtual reality short films. So thank you IP Foundation Netherlands for the good work. We do forgive you for meeting us in hockey yesterday. Uh, and uh, right now, as you go out to tea, we are going to show you glimpses of, uh, of that particular digital kiosk. much. Uh, we will break for tea. As we are a little behind schedule, we expect you to come back by 12.30. Do enjoy your tea. Thank you so much. I request you to do that silently and take your seats. As we have Miss Ostaway Exor absolutely right and rearing to go ahead. Uh, she is, uh, let's say her uh, particular presentation is going to be very, very special. She is a senior criminal analyst at the International Justice Mission. She has previously worked with the Washington DC Police Department as a criminal research specialist, where she built profiles for suspects. She also has, um, she has spent more than five years at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children as a senior analyst in the Child Victim Identification Program. So, Ms. Ostaway Itzo is absolutely the right person to go when you want to understand the nature of child exploitation in the digital era. Can we please give a big round of applause for Ms. Ostaway Itzo and welcome her on the stage. and I'm a senior criminal analyst with International Justice Mission in their Criminal Analysis Center. Today I'm going to be talking to you about our online sexual exploitation work and walking you through a case 
in which we worked recently within the past year. Because I'm going to be walking you through a case, when we get to that part of the presentation, I ask that you take uh, no pictures of that part of the presentation. Uh, everything else you can take video and pictures of. What is online sexual exploitation? There are a number of online sexual exploitation. There are numerous types of online sexual exploitation. Everything from child sex tourism to child pornography. IJAM uses this definition, and it's the production for the purpose of online publication of visual depictions that can be photos, live stream videos, screenshots of the sexual abuse of sexual abuse or exploitation of a minor for a third party who is not in the physical presence of the child in exchange for money. Just some stats on our OSEC work. Um, approximately 7,500,000 ,000 sexual predators are online at any given moment worldwide. And this number is only growing. One third of all internet users are under the age of, the eight, of 18. It's a, basically a predator's playground. Live streaming is also globally on the rise. We're seeing this in the Philippines where Specifically, it's the epicenter of live streaming. Law enforcement has been cracking down on this crime there, which means offenders are going to be looking for the next country to, to commit this crime. This is the scale of online exploitation from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. As you can see, the reports are only growing. There's a large number of reports that jump from 2015 to 2014 to 2015, and that's because these online exploitation reports are coming in from electronic service providers like Facebook, Google. They're, they were mandated in 2014 to start reporting these uh, reports on their platform, and so the number has grown exponentially and it's only getting higher. Law enforcement is not the only one that's fighting this crime. Tech companies are also fighting these crimes as well. Why is OSEC on the rise? Before, you can walk into a bar or brothel and purchase sex in person. Now you can purchase sex from the comfort of your own home or your own bedroom. Mobile devices also provide a new and evolving means by which offenders are sexually abusing children as apps are, using, are being used to target, coerce, recruit, and engage with other facilitators online. A device such as a phone, small enough to fit in someone's pocket or inside of a small purse, can facilitate the, <clears throat> sorry, can ex facilitate almost every aspect of child sexual exploitation. Everything from tracking, payment transfers, and the exploitation collaboration with other offenders. Some mobile devices are even prepaid, which make them pretty much untraceable. Easy access by the internet by all. Victims, as you know, can be male, female, and range anywhere from very young children to adolescents, hailing from ev every ethnic and socioeconomic background. In many live stream cases, Family members justify facilitating the online exploitation by asserting that it's not harmful to the child, especially in cases where there's no physical contact and there's a quick means by which the family can, can make money. Convenient payment, digital wallets, cryptocurrency, and money transfer services can all be used in sex trafficking transactions. Digital wallets facilitate online trafficking by allowing customers to pay without presenting cash or a physical credit card. Digital wallets such as PayPal, Venmo, Google Wallet, and Cash App are popular ways to transfer money quickly among abusers 
and are appealing to many because of, this, because of seamless interaction on social media platforms. I just want to walk you through how OSEC, how the method of, of OSEC. And this is a live stream case. Um, and how it happens is that the seller connects with the buyer over various platforms such as Skype or Facebook. The seller establishes that they then have access to children by showing the child on video or images. The buyer then establishes they have the means of payment or funds to abuse the child. Payment is, payment is made and buyer provides funds via various money transfer agencies. The seller then provides abuse over the various platforms. And this is where we get to the good stuff. This is gonna be, I'm gonna be talking about an OSEC case um, in which our criminal analysis team worked on in February of this year. The case was referred to us from a foreign law enforcement agency that identified 10 suspects, 19 identified victims, and over 25 Facebook accounts. IJM's Criminal Analysis Center was asked to triage efforts to identify which account should be focused on first and which suspects were in the Philippines. After reviewing about 26 Facebook accounts, their photos, their friends lists, we were able to map out overall network through social network analysis and create a map of the overall network. We were able to make a total of over 8,000 connections between all of the accounts. Three of which the accounts stood out to our analysts based on the, the user attempting to use different variations of her name, such as using, without using vowels or spelling her name backwards. We started to look at these three accounts more closely by extracting her photos, her friends list, her geotag geo locations, and determined that this one main profile of the user, as it had been updated the most and contained the most detailed information, was her main account. Between all three accounts, over 2,500 images were reviewed and analyzed from her posts, her mobile uplet, uploads, and her albums. Of those 2,500, 600 of those photos, the suspect left her, her, geo, her phone's geolotech settings on at the time of the initial upload. Of those 600, 100 of those photos were from Culabo, Philippines. On 31 occasions, she tagged herself in the Marvel neighborhood, a specific neighborhood within Culaba in the Philippines. And that was 31 times. Based on all the different images and views of the house that was posted on, the, on her Facebook account, we were able to then mosaic the different views together in order to get a better idea of what her house might look like. Based on the mosaic, we were able to show an internal layout of what her residence might look like. Of course, this was an approximation based on the photos that she had posted on social media. Once we had an idea of what the house design looked like and the approximation to other buildings, it then enhanced our attempts to locate the, the residency through satellite imagery. This is another rec rec recreation of what we thought the house might look like. We then did some open source searches on the Marble neighborhood within Kulaba to get a better idea of population and boundary line. This is a satellite view of, that shows the majority of the population in Marvel live near or on the coastline. Of 
Of those 31 pictures that the suspect geotagged, we were able to create a heat map of where those, those pictures were taken. The area de depicted in the red box shows the highest density of potential activity, so we focused on that area as a starting point of where the suspect might live, meaning she took those pictures mainly in that area, and so we focused on that area. These are some images that the suspect posted on Facebook of her graduation day. Note the date and timestamp which shows the internal and exter external of her house, of her possible residency. So we have a better understanding of what the inside of her house looks like and what the outside of her house also looks like. Next, we use Google Street View of the area we were focus focusing on to match up roof lines and pathways to the background of her picture. Same thing with these images. Again, the date stamp from her Facebook account, we were able to find the fences and exterior housing on Google Street Map, again, an open source search, and match them up with her photos. This image, the bottom right, was posted on Facebook with a date and timestamp of the, of the suspect's boyfriend, who was mentioned in the original referral. We saw here that he was working on the roof of the house, and the date and timestamp is important because we know that on that date, the roof was replaced. So we then pulled satellite imagery of that area before and after that date and looked for a building in the area with a new roof. The cell phone tower here is important in the background. It was also posted, a posted image and was also found on satellite. So that gives us an idea of what side of the tower to look for the house as well. So at this point, we had a pretty good idea of what the house, where the house was. Um, and so based on this information, we sent our partners in the Philippines out to do surveillance on the house. Once they did surveillance on the house, the suspect was sitting on her for front porch drinking coffee. So we knew what house to look at. Shortly after, they went out and conducted a rescue operation and 13 victims and two sp suspects were arrested. These are just some of the headlines from that operation that was conducted. These are also images from the actual rescue operation. Uh, this is the porch in which the suspect was sitting on, drinking her coffee before the operation took place. And so this is happening in the Philippines, and, it's, and we're combating it in the Philippines, and it wor it's working in the Philippines, and it can work everywhere else. It just doesn't stop with the victim being rescued. There's also another process in which survivors have to deal with af the aftermath. Aftercare. Of course, there are challenges with aftercare. Because the victims are so young, we need trauma-informed care processes along the pipeline of the justice system, which means everything from law enforcement to judiciary and social services. This is a very new and evolving crime. Criminals are changing the way they do things. Tech companies are changing the way they do things. And so we can't just set up a process and rely on that we have to constantly be evolving and changing with them and learning from each other, always staying one step ahead. In conclusion, I want us to take a minute and remember why we do this work. These are real children with real families that are being affected by this crime. Philippines is the epicenter of this issue, and as, as a result, we've been fighting this crime. With this, we know offenders 
will start looking for other countries in order to perpetuate this crime. That is the reason for this conference, to inspire, to exchange, to learn, and to encourage each other in ways unimaginable, unimaginable in order to end online sexual exploitation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we would like to felicitate Ms. Osterweizo. May I request uh, June Maria, eminent actor and a member of the West Bengal Council for the Protection of Child Rights, to felicitate Ostwe Itzo. Ms. Itzo gave us a wonderful global overview of criminal analytics. <laughs> complex crimes, complex times, and complex analytics to combat such newfangled but monstrous crimes. Once again, thank you so much. Uh, we would now move on to the first panel session of the conference. Uh, before I describe what this panel session is about, we have an audio visual. Can we start the audio visual? So it says it all, trends, the dark side of technology. May I request the moderator, Commander Ashok V.M. Kumar, National Director of Investigations and Law Enforcement Development, IJM, to kindly come up onto the dais. And uh, I would also invite the panelists, Mr. David Raguero, Director of Investigations and Law Enforcement Development, Cebu IJM, Mr. Nitish Chandan, UNICEF expert, Ms. Faith Turumania, Principal State Attorney, Uganda, Mr. Rizwan Sheikh, Information Security and Cybercrime Expert, India, Sri Ajay Mukundra Nadi, IPS, IGB, ICIT. And uh, may I request Onuna Chakraborty, Chairperson of West Bengal Council for Protection of Child Rights, to come up and felicitate the moderator, as also the members of the panel. Commander Ashok V. N. Kumar, who would be moderating this session, being felicitated by the chairperson of SB Gold Council for Protection of Child Rights, Onuna Chakraborty. Mr. David Rugevo. <laughs> Mr. Nidish Chandan. Ms. Nitish Chandan, Ms. Faith, Ms. Faith Turumania, the felicitations being done by 
Anuna Chakraborty, Chairperson of the West Bengal Commission for Protection of Child Rights. Mr. Rizwan Sheikh. He gets his second tutorial. Thank you so much, and now it's over to the moderator. Well, I think it's uh, a great honor this, uh, this afternoon to be part of such an august gathering. My special thanks to all the moderators who have traveled thousands of miles, uh, taken time out from a precious and a sch tight schedule out of the time to be part of this important and historic moment as far as West Bengal is concerned. I echo this, this uh, session with the, with the sound that was made by Ananya Mann this morning. She said, what West Bengal thinks is what the nation of India is going to think sooner or it's going to think fast. I think that's a fantastic statement to set the tone for our conversation. I think she needs an applause for what she said this, uh, this morning. I also want to thank all the dignitaries and the various analysis that have been brought out this far so that this session will be able to kickstart well. I want to thank each one of you right from the keynote speaker, uh, Chief Program uh, Officer of International Justice Mission and the, the Honorable Law Minister and all the senior members who were there this morning. Thank you and I think we just need to start with a Loud applause, can we do that? Yeah. Thank you for all of you. Let me set the stage because of paucity of time. I know it's time to go for lunch after this session. I promise that we will release you for lunch. And it's, a, it's an amazing lunch that is set before us. We're going to discuss in this session specifically uh, the trends uh, on the subject of human trafficking. So for our discussion of panel, we want to keep uh, uh, the whole thing little tight so that we, we, we focus on that. One is we're going to discuss on the subject of human trafficking in the lens of sex trafficking, and we're going to make further subdivide it into digital era, era and technology and how it has enhanced the sphere of sex trafficking. And the second part that we're going to uh, look at is what are the new evolving trends that are coming up in this sector, which different moderators from various countries may point out so that we are careful, we'll be to learn it and see how we as law enforcement agencies and teams be able to implement it within our region of sphere. So that's how I'm going to begin this uh, session. Okay, uh, We have got Rana Desar, who's from who's a wide spectrum of uh, uh, service. I'm going to start with him this, this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to ask him and I'm going to open the floor for a couple of you. Sir, I know that you've been part of this uh, uh, fighting this crime for a huge, almost close to about three decades now. I want to ask you, what are those two big changes that you feel as enhances crime because technology has come in. I mean, technology era has come in. How do you? Good morning, everyone. We, as a system, we, as a law enforcement agency, used to deal with traditional crime, where the reach is limited, the victim and the perpetrator are in a closed geographical location, and the methods or the modus operandi used by them are limited. We can predict it. But with the digitization and the digital era, these borders have vanished. There are no borders to the crime now. The victim may be in one place, and the perpetrator may be in another hemisphere. So that special contiguity has vanished. With this medium of cyber and other intranet and with these developments, a new medium has been provided where a perpetrator can achieve his design using n number of makers. And with technology rapidly progressing, he has ample opportunity to 
to hide his tracks, to hide his identity. And in the process, he can pose as if he is someone closer, a benefactor or a well-wisher. And in that garb, he can achieve his uh, motives or whatever uh, crime he wants to commit. So that special contiguity has vanished. The borders have vanished. So it has posed enormous challenges to law enforcement agencies in terms of the perpetrator being in different <coughs> country. So the legal system is different. When you work in, uh, as a law enforcement, you have to go by the local laws. So for example, suppose someone is impersonating or doing something, stay, say from US to a victim in India. If I want to get information from that, I have to approach the um, internet service providers, the, route, uh, the various uh, service providers in US to get the information. Where the servers are located in foreign countries, we face often face challenges in getting those information. So these are the new challenges. Further, we need to be technologically advanced to find out how he is uh, hiding his uh, tracks, how to go deep into it. There is a dark web which has which has no indexing system. So you can't really have the IP address and track that person. So whole clandestine operations are being worked out through the dark web, which is posing a serious challenge. It is used for both criminal activities, for terrorism, for human trafficking, for n number of illegal things. So these are the new challenges. We can start with this uh, new challenge. It's wonderful, sir. I think you brought out two key points that you said that with technology, the crime has become borderless, which means the geographical domains are no more uh, defined. And the second thing you said, the camouflage has become much easier for them to be detected. I think with that, I'll just go to Dave. I know Dave uh, 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 Sibo has done a fantastic, it was amazing to see the reduction level presented by uh, the Chief Program Officer, uh, Blair. It's, it's really amazing that you are part of that team. I want to ask you, as uh, Ranade sir has brought out this afternoon, that is cross borders, how did you tackle uh, when it came to people who did not belong to your geographical terrain? I'm sure you, you had some people who were exploiters from the. How did you handling this case? Do you have a story to share, or maybe some of the lessons for the audience this afternoon? Yes, thank you. Um, our current casework, online sexual exploitation of children, frequently involves foreigners abusing children within the Philippines. Um, I believe Ostaway mentioned a statistic of 750,000 online predators at any given time who are doing nothing except looking for victims to exploit every free minute of every day. Uh, your moderator earlier used the word monstrous to describe the crime. And so I want to share a short story to give you a glimpse of what we're seeing in the Philippines. Um, last year we received a report from Norway uh, that was sent to Philippine police regarding a Norwegian man who began chatting online with a woman named Sharon in the Philippines. Sharon had a two-year-old son and a five-year-old daughter. What this man wanted was for Sharon to find a Filipino man to rape her two-year-old son and five-year-old daughter. And she did. He began sending her money and ultimately allowed this abuse of her child to take place. When she said the word monstrous, that's what it reminded me of. Um, every day, these people are online looking for offenders, looking to gain access to a child to abuse and exploit. I think we talk so much about the complexity of these investigations and the use of dark web. Um, what we're seeing in the Philippines is, for the most part, it's taking place on day-to-day -day common social media that everyone is familiar with and everyone can use. And that's because that's how an offender gains access to a child to communicate directly to that child or to communicate to someone who will have access to a child. In the Philippines, Facebook is common, Skype is common. Whatever is used by the general public is what these predators will exploit in order to find their victims. That's, that's, that's wonderful, uh, David. Uh, you're saying that this, the platforms have become the primary paradigms on which law enforcement agency has focused, especially the story that you have shared. So that takes me to Two, two experts who are there with me, uh, 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 who come from uh, the world of technology, okay? Uh, we've got uh, uh, 
uh, Nitesh uh, and uh, Rizwan. I'm going to ask Rizwan. Rizwan, I know you heard what, what Davis shared in that story. My question to you is, I know you see a lot of stories on the dark side of the web. I'm sure. No, I, don't, I know you don't want to confess it here. But I'm sure as, you're, as you see a lot of things. Can you tell us two new trends that you feel that as a law enforcement agency, uh, knowing the dark side of technology, that you want to highlight it to the audience today? Okay, thank you very much for this question. Uh, first of all, we have to accept the fact, I would rather say the bitter fact that uh, the investigation uh, or we can say uh, the limit to investigate something is very less when it comes to the dark net or the deep web <laughs> of the internet. Uh, to explain in a very short, uh, for any investigation process, how exactly it works, uh, suppose you go on Facebook or you open google.com, the first thing happens is the website records your IP address. For example, any one of you, if you just open google.com in your cell phone or in your laptop, you can see Google India written on the right bottom side. The same happened with me when I went to some other country, that country's name was written. So how Google is aware you are from India? It's because of the IP address you are connected to. And when you connect to the internet, you are assigned with a unique IP address at that particular given point of time and your ISP has all your KYC information that this person is connected to the internet. Now suppose if any fraudulent post or any illegal post is done on Facebook or any other social media site, the basic investigation process is basically the law enforcement will be contacting Facebook or the service provider and they will be getting the IP address of the person who created the post or whatsoever. Now what happens in the dark net or the deep web? This particular section, what we call as darknet, is considered as 96% of the internet. The internet which is accessible to the common people, the internet that you and I access, including Google, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or let it be any other websites of the world. It is just the 4% of the internet. The remaining 96% is hidden, which is inaccessible, inaccessible by common people. Now, to access this part of internet, there are some uh, different domains, typically uh, .onion, and it's accessed using a Tor web browser on the technical side. But it's highly anonymous. It's very highly encrypted, highly anonymous. And the tra tracking and tracing person inside Darknet is one of the toughest thing ever. It is not impossible, yes, but it's one of the tough. And this is what being used for all such activities. That's, that's, that, that's, that's a great revelation that you're giving us. I just want uh, maybe to take this from where uh, 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 Rizwan has stopped, Nitesh. Uh, Nitesh, can you tell us at, at the dark side of, he's given us that 96% of it is hidden. Do you think, is there something that we can do in spite of, those, in spite of that behavior and trends that we can observe in the dark net to address this issue of online sexual exploitation, which uh, David was talking about with Ranade sir also brought out that how technology has become a challenge. Will you be able to throw some light on that? Right, thank you. Thank you so much. So first of all, uh, I'll draw from Dave's uh, discussion about how mainstream uh, uh, technologies and platforms are uh, in fact used. So I'd uh, like to highlight, you know, platforms uh, these days. Uh, I mean, uh, most of us have seen those video sharing platforms uh, where kids are seen dancing to Bollywood songs, for instance. Uh, or uh, their suggestive videos. Now, these are not platforms on the deep web or the dark web. These are public platforms, and most often uh, they operate without any regulation. So, if we were to look at uh, the US, for example, they have a SESTA and FOSTA Act in place, which now makes these intermediaries liable. But as far as India is concerned, we don't have a law to that effect. But that's the story of the surface internet. Uh, specifically, talking about the deep web, uh, I'd like to ask uh, a question to everybody here. Uh, would you think that? Uh, a handbook on how to become a pedophile would be available on the internet? No. But on the deep web, it is. And it is as easily accessible as making a Google search. And believe me you, it has chapters on how do you find children who are vulnerable, uh, how do you entice a children, how do you have sex with a child. These are chapters in the book and it's publicly accessible. So this is just... Uh, a bird's eye view of the trend, but when you go deeper into it, uh, now uh, having worked in this space uh, with an organization called Cyber Peace Foundation and uh, UNICEF on some of our projects, uh, I was curious and we went on to the deep web to investigate further. Uh, what came as an interesting revelation is that uh, on most of these platforms on the deep web, uh, we like to say oh, the deep web is bad, bad, the dark web is bad, uh, 
actually most of these platforms uh, they have a strict no policy to child pornography child sexual abuse material they say it's a big big no but then there there is a dark side of the deep web also which is not indexed which only if i tell you you'll be able to access it it's not indexed so you're not going to be able to access it now there uh, sometimes money works but most of the times how you get access is through media exchange it's a barter so if if i were to provide you a real csam video only then you'll give me access to that particular portal so this is one challenge apart from that uh, i mean uh, law enforcement and everybody needs to understand today that uh, perhaps 10 years ago technology was geeky encryption was a wild term today everybody wants encryption you have it on your phones on whatsapps so we need to get out of this uh, misconception that criminals are not smart i mean they may they might not be smart but encryption is available right off the shelf so bitcoin now when you when you see you club the deep web with a transaction over bitcoin which is anonymous uh, money transfer you're actually leading yourself into uh, into a very complex investigation altogether where as as i already pointed out we cannot locate the criminal now because the money trail is also uh, not possible to investigate we can't even get into that but interestingly in hyderabad there has been a case where the deep web itself uh, now this this might uh, seem a little odd but uh, the officer says i mean this was an undercover oh so the officer says that uh, i'd like to uh, you know try to deal with you and uh, he says okay fine you have to pay this this much of amount in bitcoin he says mujhe bitcoin use karna nahi aata i don't know how to use uh, bitcoin can you give me your paytm wallet number and he uh, the, the perpetrator actually gives him the paytm wallet number i mean it's uh, it's uh, it's investigation techniques like these that not just in the law enforcement but many other law enforcement agencies in other countries are also using so saying that uh, deep web is is the bad part i would not say that i would i will uh, actually refrain from mentioning from I mean, making a statement like that because the surface web itself uh, i mean applications being operated out of countries where there is no regulation we see uh, there is a there is a uh, out of bihar there is a channel of uh, that's that's being operated by a girl uh, it has got a particular name it has got about 80 to 90000 followers and all the, all the content that is available on this platform is suggestive uh, videos or there there is a you know a, sh a shirt lift off something like that happening so this is unregulated there is no law against it there is there is no company that is even willing to regulate as opposed to us or the uk where they have a digital economy act which says which is which is trying to enforce that children cannot access pornography now that's again a matter of debate but uh, again that's how it is and one interesting trend which i think uh, ranjit sir will also agree with me when i say this is that uh, amongst law enforcement agencies whatsapp is a very big uh, cause of concern uh, why because we we operate a helpline also and uh, just about a month ago we really we, really, we got a tip from a woman uh, under an assumed name Uh, she sent us screenshots of a whatsapp group with about 96 participants in the group only, each of them only sharing child pornography so uh, that that kind of uh, again it's it's almost very difficult to uh, investigate them getting ip addresses most of the law enforcement is not aware that it's also happening in many parts of the country so there are the challenges i mean that is that is the amongst the most recent trends i mean yeah that's yes i think i think you opened a but both i want to put a question to both of you Uh, since you are since you mentioned about encryption uh, the question that i have for you is is it really encryption because i am a cryptographic officer an old school cryptographic guy who looked at numbers and alphabets and did cryptography is the encryption that is is it safe it's not i want to hear from you is it safe because most of the platforms say encrypted or the data that's going is safe that's one question uh second is we also had the voice of the child that spoke on behalf of the all the children you know this morning and she said we still need the social platform yeah we don't want you to do away i help that we need is tell us you know how do we handle this okay uh, so question number one is you know uh, is it encryption really true or is it a myth you can you can enlighten us because you are the expert on that second is uh, you 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 can you tell us uh, how the 96% can be kept away for genuine users who want only the 4% of the internet yeah can you just quickly highlight that okay covering up your first question about encryption encryption is nothing uh, with regards to anonymity encryption is something which is done to avoid <laughs> hacking or leaking of your data for example 
if we both are connected to the Wi-Fi network and I'm chatting with you over WhatsApp, now if I run a sniffer in the Wi-Fi, there might be possibility I can sniff your chat record since you are connected to my Wi-Fi. But if it's encrypted, even sniffing don't work at uh, so easy, but even if it works, it will give me junk characters since the data is encrypted. So encryption is basically, uh, I would say in very layman terms, locking it with junk characters that only the other person, the receiving party can decrypt from his keys. Yes. So this is what encryption is. So do you, do so you feel, uh, is it safe? How do you say for uh, us? Now there are types of encryptions. There are bits of encryption. Like social platforms. On social platforms, yes, it is, but obviously safe. Uh, like WhatsApp has a very good encryption. Now it depends. If you have a weak encryption policy, then it is but obviously. So my encryption. question to you is: Will the digital signature remain forever? Because one of the trends that we found is digital signatures don't appear even after six to eight hours, and retracing them is a big challenge for us. It's a new trend. It wasn't when when the when the internet started for us to handle human. Tra I mean, the subject of what we are dealing with. See, coming to the part of when you're talking about tracking, tracing, or investigating something, uh, you don't always have to go in deep in the content. For example, one of a very good example given by uh, him was about WhatsApp group. So once you have the screenshot, you know what is the content of the group. You don't typically go deeper to get the content of the particular group. All you can do is like communicate with the service provider and try to get the IP address of those who are connected in the group and what are the numbers, if by any chance you have any kind of data. That you, but obviously so those are some of the possibilities that you would that, say that's that. That's the only possibility. That's, that's, that's helpful. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. What this encryption, what you are saying, like it is good for the individual. What you are communicating is safe. But it also poses a challenge to the investigating officer. Okay. He also doesn't get information about I, I, so that's a, if, if I may add to that, yes. just, just one bit for if there are law enforcement officers in the house, there was a, uh, a order by a US district court, uh, and it, it would be interesting for everybody. It says uh, that the court is directing WhatsApp to pen tap a few numbers and give give out all content information about the uh, the conversation that they're having. And WhatsApp has complied to that order. It's out there on the internet also. So if at all encryption is, in the real sense, like you said, uh, encryption is debatable. And now, because it's operated out of California, the Indian laws do not apply. Correct. We do not, law enforcement officers here, we can only ask for non-content data, which is the IP address, which is the number, which is the last scene, which is perhaps a profile picture. But when you go to the States, or other jurisdiction where they are enforcing their own laws, they're asking for content data. What What is the actual communication that has happened be between these people now? Like Rizwan said, you can you can take this screenshot of a WhatsApp group, mm -hmm. but when you go to the court... It's not. It's, yes. it's not admissible. So yes. it's, it still needs a hash value channel. authorized by a, I agree with you. I would also like to make one point. When we say of uh, this WhatsApp and other things and uh, cyber bullying part of it, it happens quite innocuously. Like in classroom, a person uh, physically uh, bullying someone, it doesn't take place or uh, it, is, it is likely to be detected. So they are switching into Facebook and bullying. And uh, in one of the surveys uh, that I read in the internet, almost 43% of students admitted that they were bullied. And surprisingly, 56% admitted that they were bullying others. So they were. So it's a two-sided sword. It is a two-sided sword, and they didn't think that it is something odd or illegal or is a crime something. They were doing it just to harass that class fellow who is the problem. So these that's, things innocuously start, and then uh, that's leave. that's that's a good insight, sir. That's wonderful, ma'am. I'm coming back to you. Yeah, you heard uh, uh, right from Cebu to challenges to dark web. You know, uh, I know uh, Uganda uh, has seen a rise of crime. In the last 15 years, yeah, uh, the it's exponential crime. That's the word that is used. The, 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 the rise is exponential. Uh, did you find any trends in the last 10, 10 to 15 years, especially in the segment of child exploitation, which you feel uh, it's good for us to be alerted uh, before it replicates to us at a, at the scale at which it is there in your country? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yes, in Uganda like in the last 10 years or in the past, the, the issue of child exploitation online was hardly heard of. Um, we, we've had so many other crimes, but that was never a common crime in Uganda. And with uh, all we had, which was common, is the domestic kind of trafficking 
in the country, whereby uh, children, let me say, are moved from a, a certain region to the main city, and for exploitation purposes, they end up being street children. At the end of it all, that was domestic, really, and uh, we, we, which, as the government handled using the local laws, we, of course, the constitution of the, of the country, and we have a children's act that would deal with such issues, and the penal code act. Um, we have a trafficking in persons act, those that used to solve such issues. With the emergency of technology in the country, along the years now, we have seen a lot of child abuse online, which is coming up, and emerging very fast with the technology. Uh, children are exposed to the technology, to the phones, to the uh, computers, uh, at a very early age. Uh, almost a child from six onwards, six years onwards, has access to a phone, and they get onto Twitter, Facebook, and all that, and end up being exposed to certain uh, vices along the way. And uh, as a country, and, and the government of Uganda, with that emergency, uh, so many laws have now come up to sort that kind of issue. We have the Computer Misuse Act, Electronic Transactions Act, e-signature. Uh, along the way, we have the Anti-Pornography Act, uh, which has just come up to deal with such issues. And because it is a new trend, uh, it, the traffickers keep ahead. So the government keeps coming up with new policies. Uh, together, we are working with foreign agencies uh, to curb the vice, uh, the British government came in to help UNICEF, USAID, and, and uh, it's all revolving around curbing the online child ex sex exploitation in the country, and of course putting into mind the international treaties and conventions, the UN conventions, which uh, recognize the rights of the children. So yeah, the, 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 with trend, with the technology, it is coming up. It's a, a vice that's coming up so fast in Uganda. There are challenges, definitely. Along the way, we've met uh, several challenges. Yeah. So did you, did you resonate with what Dave said? Dave, do, 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 do you see the same exponential change in, in, in your region also, like what she's sharing now? Yeah, she's I think, seen it in the last 15 years. I think it's really helpful to hear the perspective from Uganda, as well as in India and the Philippines, because what we're identifying is that there's certain enabling factors, right, in each country that are going to lead to the trends that develop in those countries. Okay. And so the, the enabling factors we see in the Philippines are most people speak English, so it's very easy for them to communicate with foreigners around the world. There's a, a huge network of money transfer agencies because there's so many overseas Filipino workers. And at the same time, the internet is everywhere. And so the borders are gone, right? Within a country, outside of a country, there's no more borders. and so that trend has continued to increase uh, throughout so, the Philippines. So, so before you make a comment, I just want you to answer along with the comment. Uh, how do we see this around an exploitation? I know as a nation we moved from a conventional, traditional prostitution to brothels to, to now we moved into this organized crime as human trafficking. Over the na last 90 years, this transition has been very, very successive. Now we are talking about child exploitation and we have heard People saying it's viewing, it's telecast, you know, grooming you, use the words. Can you add, throw some light for us in this region since you, you can some thing that you can say, is it, how quickly is it happening, how fast is it happening, is it relevant for us? Uh, it's uh, happening at a very rapid pace, like the penetration on use of uh, mobile phones, smartphones, it is actually growing exponentially. And because of uh, lack of knowledge and the uh, cyber safety aspect of it. It's uh, the children are willingly, unwillingly uploading various self-exposure images, putting uh, private things and getting trapped, blackmailed and abused. So that is a very alarming trend that is... Uh, another point which I want to make here is all these uh, clandestine operations, they also use the legitimate businesses. Like for human trafficking, they also use the normal money transfer routes, the hospitality industry, the transportation. All these legitimate channels are used for achieving their nefarious end. And they couch it, hide it in such a way that is difficult to detect. So if we want to fight human trafficking or any of these abuses, we need to have all these partners in loop. So they red flag wherever they detect something abnormal. 
but often the profit motive probably makes them ignore these things. But we need to educate them and partner them in our effort to control these things. That's very interesting, sir, because the DNA of an organized crime has to have money. There is a flow of money. Uh, in the audience, uh, we've got joint CP Balakrishnan. Can somebody give the mic to, uh, to the joint commissioner of Chennai? Can, can we just pass him a mic? Uh, so we're sitting there, yeah, can just. Uh, so I just wanted to ask you, since, since you heard us speak, I want you to ask, do you think the IT Act that we have is, as Blair said this morning, a good law uh, is first of all good and not enforcing it is cri equally criminal. So I want to ask you, do you think, as we're talking on this digital and technical, technological era, uh, in, your, in your experience, because you handled both bonded labor and sex trafficking uh, in Chennai, uh, and I want you to say, is this law adequate enough or do you feel it still needs some tightening? What is your view on that? I think by and large the law is good, but definitely there are some loopholes. And we experience the loopholes as we uh, come across with new cases and new uh, information. Um, definitely, we need a thorough review of the uh, law uh, periodically to update the provisions to tackle the uh, upcoming trends in the crime. As far as uh, Chennai is concerned, uh, I would call uh, the crime trend, trend is more of a hybrid uh, modus operandi. Um, like uh, it is a combination of uh, conventional methods as the, and the technology. And uh, uh, the response from the law enforcement is also uh, on these two accounts. Uh, we combine the conventional methods and the um, technology to tackle the crime. Of course, what we have witnessed in Chennai is uh, uh, still more of uh, uh, using the technology at the surface level rather than at the deep level. Or maybe uh, such, uh, such things are happening, but it uh, definitely has not come to our notice yet. Um, we uh, need a, a collaboration between the enforcement agencies and the techies on a continuous basis to uh, find out um, you know, whether this uh, uh, so far unknown uh, kind of crimes are happening uh, in any area. But uh, because we depend on the uh, uh, information we receive uh, from the uh, public. Uh, we uh, basically, uh, we don't uh, uh, do continuous research on what is uh, happening there. So, with specific point to the law, uh, present law we have, definitely the law uh, is a very good starting point for us to take care of most of the crimes, but then, uh, uh, you know, uh, the more sophisticated uh, crimes used by using the technology uh, definitely need to be uh, tackled by uh, by continuous uh, brainstorming and amendments, uh, which to, uh, is to be added to the existing law. That's 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 wonderful, sir. Thank you so much. I want to open the floor this uh, for the next few minutes. If you have any questions, could you just raise your hand? Maybe one of you could be. Yeah. Maybe a few questions I can take. Otherwise, your lunch will get delayed. Yeah. Uh, uh, two guidelines: be very short. Don't ask long sentences so that the odd, the moderators can quickly answer to you. Can you just pass the mic, please, to one one or two? Or, yeah. They have raised their hands. Anybody? Yeah. Can you just pass the mic? Anybody with the mic? Yeah. Yes, introduce us. Tell us your name. I am Suresh Kumar. I am serving as a judge in Tamil Nadu, District Legal Service Authority. My concern is striking out of section 66A of the Information Technology Act as totally unconstitutional is unacceptable because that has to be dissected. If the act is totally set as an unconstitutional means, it has paved a way of, uh, wrongdoers have been going unnoticed. It, some stringent things has to be done, or else that act uh, must be uh, uh, brought into execution as well as possible. Okay. So you're saying right from 65 to 67 of the IT Act, yeah. which amplifies it, yeah. have to be further yeah, stringently made. That's the legislature has done it for a purpose. Hmm. So it cannot be made unconstitutional right away. It has to be bisected the good part and bad part and uh, compare uh, freedom of uh, speech and expression and all the guaranteed fundamental rights are, of course, necessary. But the restrictions has to be borne in mind. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good comment. Yeah, yeah. Can you just pass the mic here to this gentleman, please? Yes. Uh, yes. So, uh, we work with the street children and specific question to Rizwan and Nitish. Uh, what we don't get we get to see uh, 
our children start using mobile phone certainly whatsapp groups are getting created and one of our member were put into the group and we started seeing lot of uh, voluptuous pictures of the kids coming there yes point is question is we don't have an understanding of what to do then because this is not an offense but how as a technical person uh, is there or agencies organizations we know there are technical ha ethical hackers uh, game uh, young game gaming persons can you give us yeah, those got kinds it. of got, got your question uh, i don't know whether you've seen the mhr released a booklet for students and children on the 3rd december 2018 i can give you the soft copy of it on your whatsapp uh, it talks about cyber grooming, uh, email frauding, different kind of thing they may check with in consultation with the government of, released by the government of India. That gives you the law enforcement steps for parents, for the child, for the victim. What are the actions that you need to do? Please collect a copy. The questions that you're asking will 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 be happy to address it. Already published. This is recently published on 3rd December 2018. Our government is doing a good job. Yes. Can I have, yeah, one, one. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Asif, uh, I am from PwC. Uh, my question to the law enforcement, especially to Ajay Ranade and uh, Rajwan, we hear a lot of cases that, you know, social media companies like Facebook, Twitter and WhatsApp do not cooperate. So how do you actually do the investigation in these circumstances? What is the best practices being followed around the world? Yeah, thank you so much, sir. I think I wanted him to answer that question, but there's a next session which is called Challenges. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. one minute, sir. There is a next session called Challenges. The moderators will cover that in that session. So I, I think I'll, I'll reserve that question to the next session. I don't want to eat up the next moderators. See, my name is Shruta Gopalde. I'm the head of child protection and advocacy of a national level organization called Vikram Sela Education Resource Society. I have two questions. One is, after a lot of struggle, India has got a very progressive act legislation called Protection of Children from Sexual Offenses Act in short, POXO. POXO. Uh, but so far I have gone through the POXO, do not have dedicated and committed provision for dealing with the issue of digital sexual exploitation. Though some of the, some of the provisions could be further interpreted, but not exclusive. Do you think, my, my question to the August gathering, the panel, panel is uh, uh, whether an amendment is required? And my second question is, see, I have seen two years child is having mobile while pair, mother is feeding the child. Then what would be the age appropriate mechanism of handling digital gadget? In the era of digitization, it is not much possible to keep the child away from the digital gadget. Then what would be the age appropriate? And we do not, I do not know whether this kind of communication material is available in the international domain, but in our country, it is not there. Done, sir. Your second question, I'll leave the first question for Ranade to answer. The second question is, morning, the voice of the survivor said, they are a generation Z. Uh, which means days are coming when they will refuse to come out of the womb if you don't give them a while. <laughs> Generation C. Yeah. That's the second part. Yes, I agree with you. Uh, I can't say which is the age age thing, but definitely the generations that is coming is Generation Z. They are technically savvy. The world is techn technology. And the request from all the children to us this morning was, don't tell us to abstain from technology. As elders, help us to tide over this challenge so that we don't become victims. That's been the voice that, I, that I'm going to take. The first part, maybe I'll ask you, sir, too. Uh, we have POSCO uh, Act, which is a very good act, very deterrent. Uh, the onus is on the perpetrator. There are some provisions which we can use, but yes, I agree. There are no exclusive provisions to deal with this. And uh, whenever a law is probably drafted, they take into consideration various um, cultural background and other things. In cyber crime aspect, basically, uh, because of the virtual nature and the borderless nature of it, we need to harmonize legal terms also between different countries so that uh, crime taking place in India may be, should also be uh, 
incorporated as crime in some uh, in other countries also. That's uh, actually needed. And that legal framework we need to create. I agree, sir, our laws are not as stringent as what you said, but I think the whole of the governments and the law enforcement agencies and the NGOs like IGM, they're all working towards as much as we can make it right. Sure, I agree with the point taken. Yes, yes, that's, 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 that's fantastic. You. That's wonderful. I think that, I think you said it, I think we should just clap for what they're doing now. That's, that's wonderful. One more question can I take from the audience? Yes, you look very desperate. Why don't you just give them the phone, uh, microphone? Yes, I am Snitezu from Hindustan Times. Uh, I, my question is from is to Mr. Ranade and the Dev both. Uh, what, according to your estimate, is the percentage of conventional methods used in sexual uh, exploitation of children and digital methods? And is the percentage changing and how fast? It is according to your experience and estimate, if there is no data. Uh, it is difficult to uh, answer in uh, clear statistical terms because we don't have a survey. But what uh, we experience, like the parents come to us saying that the uh, picture of his uh, daughter is morphed or uh, there's impersonation or something. All they want is removal of that picture, but they don't want to proceed legally because it uh, stigma is attached to whatever action they take. If the girl will not be married or there will be she will be ostracized and all things. So the registration as such remains less, but instances and the occurrences are taking place and they are increasing rapidly. That's what I can say. Thank you, sir. I just want to sum up the few keynotes of the moderation and then I'll hand it over to the moderator. Uh, the keynotes that are of this panel discussion has come that it is a borderless crime. Okay. Uh, we are making technology has made camouflage more stringent, I mean, it's made it more difficult for people to work as a trend. We found that child abuse, which was not happening at rapidly, you heard him saying that it is now moving at an exponential rate, as far as we are concerned. We are the experts saying that what you're accessing on the internet is only 4%, 96% of it is still hidden, and it is in the dark web, but they've highlighted some of the things. Encryption is still a myth, not a real guarantee that what you're sending data is going to be Bitcoin's access, and finally, the the law was discussed that it needs to be more stringent. We had joint CP saying that we have adequate law, but we also had another voice which says that needs to be tightened up. With that, I want to thank all the panelists who are there this, this afternoon with me. Can we just give them a round of applause? And over to you now. Thank you so much. Uh, lunch then. Uh, after lunch, we are going to reconvene at 2.30 p.m. sharp. And ladies and gentlemen, on your way to lunch, which is served in hall number two of uh, the same floor, the first floor, uh, do once again check on the digital console. Incidentally, incidentally, is any of you missing your phone? In that case, you would have to go to the kiosk, describe your phone, and retrieve it. Mm -hmm.